The title of the message today is Out With The Old, In With The New. So, out with the old, in with the new. We've heard that phrase before, right? And, and, and what has that? You know, usually that means like, hey, I'm going to start a, um, you know, out with the old relationship, in with the new relationship. Maybe it's on New Year's, uh, things like that. So we'll, we'll, we, we'll say things like, oh, well, I, you know, I'm done with that. Out with the old and in with the new. Bring on the new, you know. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of truth to that, and we need to, there's a lot of truth in that in the sense of, of, of things of our past and who we are now. And uh, we're going to look into that. We're going to dissect that. And one of the words that God really spoke to me was contrast. And contrast, there's a difference. There's a striking difference between the two. You'll see the contrast in something. So we're going to kind of go over a lot of scripture, actually a whole lot of scripture. I think I printed two extra copies if anybody wants to share um, of, of some notes. Because we're going to go over actually 29 different verses. And, and the reason is because... A lot of times we'll pick out one verse and we'll kind of dissect it, but, but to get the concept of what God is trying to show us out with the old and with the new, I kind of had to use like five and six verses within that so we can get the right context. How many of us know that just reading one scripture doesn't put it into context? Sometimes you have to read what's before and what's after to get the whole thing in context because I've heard a lot of people, they'll say they'll grab this and then they apply it to their life, but they're not seeing the whole totality of God's heart in that context and we have to understand that so let's go right into it if you're following at home we are going to start with romans 5 12 through 17 i'm going to be reading reading from the new living translation at the moment again out with the old in with the new come join us please share like josh said earlier thank you father god all right so rapid fire here we go romans 5 12 through 17 when adam sinned i mean when adam sinned sin entered the world adam sin brought death so death spread to everyone. If you guys don't know, this is Romans, so this is Paul speaking, by the way. For everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died because sin equals death, right? From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ. Who was yet to come? But there is a great difference, there's that difference, between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that of one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. So again, contrasting Adam and Jesus, and you, you saw it, he was just, he was going back and forth, back and forth for us to understand something. See, sin is the virus that entered the world, right? Sin is the virus that entered in, and through that, death, death came for all of us. We had no choice. Death came. And, what, and did Adam drop dead? No, it was a spiritual death, being separated from God. Adam and Christ was the contrast. We want to see the difference of that because it's going to lead to other things, other contrasts that we're going to see as we continue to read further. So again, through Adam's sin equals death. What was it? God's free gift of Christ equals life. There's the contrast. Death and life. Adam, Christ. Sin for many, freedom in him, right? And we're going to, we're going to see this and he's going to keep dissecting this. So here it is. Paul keeps going in Romans 6. And he goes on, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Again, why a baptism is so important? Because it's that, it's that representation of who we were and dying to our old self or dying with Christ, recognizing that we died with Christ and we were raised up with him. You know, just like he was raised up, we were raised up. So that's why baptism is important. And just as Christ were raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ, 
so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. It's funny, I paraphrased that whole thing and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize. Anyways, Romans 6, 14 through, 6, uh, through 16, Paul continues and he's going on. He's getting us to understand something. Again, we have to see it in context of, of the whole thing that he's painting the picture of. And it's leading, it's going to be leading somewhere that he's going to uh, drive a point home. Romans 6, 14 through 16, you're following at home. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live, like we sang the song, live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, what does that mean? Do we go on sinning? Continue sinning? Of course not. There's an explanation point. Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, we saw, or you can choose to obey God which leads to righteous living. It comes down to us believing which one. Here's the contrast of death and life. Old man, new man. Paul's continuing on. He's explaining something to us here. And what I see contrast, the definition of contrast, to be strikingly different, like dark is to light, like old is to new, right? Adam is to Christ. Sin to God's grace condemnation to made right with God. His and our death to his and our life. Power of the law to freedom in Christ. Desires of the flesh, we know, we know that all too well, right? To living in the spirit. Another contrast is old covenant to new covenant. We're going to look further and see what that actually means from Old Covenant to New Covenant and, and, and see what, what he, he wants our lives to look so different than what it used to be. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand that because we understand the things that we've done or where we've come from. So sometimes it's hard to see God's love through it all. And he's going to show us, hey, I love you so much you don't even know. <laughs> I love you so much you just don't have a clue on how much. So he can continue. So remember, we started at Romans 5. We went to 6. Now we're in Romans 7. If you're following at home still, Romans 7, 4 through 6. Still reading out of the New Living Translation. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are, not, you, you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. We saw that already. Sin equals death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. Again, contrast, old, new, not by obeying the letter of the law, because we're not under the law anymore, right? But in the new way of living in the spirit. Paul goes on to explain this later at the Church of Corinth um, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3, and he goes like this because the, the Church of Corinth was already starting to see false teachers coming in and telling them things about this and that. Oh, you can't eat that. That's unclean. And, and uh, you need to be circumcised and all these things. And, and they were already, false teaching was already coming. And I was talking to my mom about this not too long ago. Isn't it something how, you know... In, in Corinth, if you look at it, I think this that was A.D. maybe 49 or 45. Don't quote me on that, but somewhere around there. So you're talking like 14, 15 years after Christ's resurrection, you know, his death and resurrection. And within 15 years, there's already false teaching going on. So how much more false teaching could there possibly be now, today, almost 2,000 years later? And this is why he wants us to have ears to hear. Even in Revelation, when he talks to John, he said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear all the way to Revelation. So this is going to be an ongoing thing. That's why we want to know Christ. We want to get to know Him intimately so that we can understand what He's saying to our hearts. Amen? So 2 Corinthians 3.3 Corinthians 3 goes on and says, Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. 
This letter is not written, not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. What, what, what else, the, 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 the tablets of stone, didn't God, with the finger of God, write the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses? Yes, and they were good. But now he's carved them onto our hearts. He wants us to see something here. No longer is it going to be the tablets, but now it's written on our hearts. He calls us to be living epistles. And it's all going to come together as we continue going for, uh, further. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. All right. You're still awake at home. Yes, you are. So follow along. Here it is. He has enabled us. Us. Who's us? The believers. The saints. Okay? I say saints because we're no longer sinners. We're saints, but we have to believe. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the spirit. The old covenant ends in death. But under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. Again, more contrast. More things looking strikingly different than what we thought. Okay? He goes on. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 12. The old ways... The, with laws etched in stone led to death. You, we keep seeing this all throughout scripture. He keeps saying the same thing over and over. There must be a point he's trying to drive, that, a point that he wants us to see something going from one place to another place, okay, so that the contrast could, could really be shown. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God. Even though the brightness was already fading away, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? That's a question. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, has been, past tense, has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? I wonder why it remains forever. Maybe because Jesus, the finished work, he reigns forever, right? And ever, and ever, and ever. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Man, and that's why it reminds you of that scripture, come boldly and confidently to the throne room of God, right? But we have to understand something in order to do that, and we're going to continue on and see this. After I take a quick sip. Mm -hmm. God is so good. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we continue on. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14. We, remember earlier what was we? We were the believers. We, the saints. We that follow Christ. Remember, he talked about that earlier. So he's going on with that same conversation with us. And he says, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face. So the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers the minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. And I underlined those words. I underlined a lot. If you're following at home with notes or if you have notes here um, at, at Livewire Church, the, uh, the reason I underlined everything, I wanted you to see the contrast of the things that were different. And, and things that were important. So right there I ended up with believing in Christ. Believing in Christ. Um, that last song we sang, you know, I believe in the resurrection. You know, I believe in Christ. I believe in the finished work. I believe in Him. These are the things we got to constantly tell ourselves. I believe. I believe. I believe. And, and there's times where maybe we're going through a tough time and maybe it is hard to believe. But even in that hard to believe, he can help us with our unbelief. But let's be honest with ourselves and not think, okay, let me try to do this on my own. No, you come to him and you say, Lord, help me with my unbelief because right now it's hard for me to believe you during this situation that I'm going through. 
And just be honest with yourself because there's something about being honest and surrendering us and our will and our hearts and surrendering in that. I believe there's a process of surrender that happens and in that process of surrender, there's a glory that comes upon us and there's the, 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 the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? He's our comforter. He will come to us and he will comfort us. I have this thing, I tell my mom, I said, yeah, it's every once in a while you, you, you start speaking the word of God like what we're doing right now, the Holy Spirit just takes over and you just feel it and you're just like, man, thank you, Lord, because he loves the praises of, 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 of Jesus, of God, and the Holy Spirit just loves that and, and he's our comforter. So I always tell my mom, when you feel that and, you, it, it, and I tell my friends, I said, it feels like a massage. And, and, and then recently I was like, you know why it feels like a massage? Because the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And he's comforting. He's like, man, doesn't that feel good? I said, yes, it does. It does. He's like, Keeps, keep remaining in me, abiding in me, um, and, and, and I in you. So believing in Christ. We sang it in the song. Believing, 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 believing. If sin is the virus, then believing in Christ is the antidote. Believing in Christ is the antidote. It's the vaccine. It's the thing that cures us from sure death, right? And we know this, to go from death to life, but we have to look at the finished work of Christ by believing. And that will knock out the effects of sin. Out with the old, in with the new, by believing in the finished work of Christ Jesus, our Lord. But we have to believe. It goes back, like I said, to believe. We are saved by faith through grace. Grace, God's grace that he uh, bestowed on us to even give us an opportunity to believe and have faith in Jesus. And in that, the byproduct is being saved from death to life. Check this out. In John 6, 29, Jesus says it like this. <laughs> and, and, and to give you, like, because we talked about context, let me give you some context since I only have the one verse here. The context here is Jesus has been doing miracles. He's been going on doing healing people. This has happened. All these wonderful miracles and works of God are happening, right? And not just his, his close disciples that are with him, but the other followers are with him. And they're asking him this question. They're saying, man, Jesus, how are you doing all these miracles? Like, we want to do these wonderful works too. Like, show us, show us, show us. We want these miracles. We want to do these things. And this is what, just as Jesus' answer. And let's take heart to what he says. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. This is Jesus' words. The only work he wants from us is to believe in the one he has sent. You know, if you read the next verse after it, you know what the followers say? They say this. They said, so, so what works do we need to do then? What, how do we do these miracles? They didn't have ears to hear. He just said to them, the only work is to believe. And they're already asking, well, what other works? What else do we need to do? What else do we need to do? How do we do this? How? They went right back to their original question, yet he already answered them, but they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't catch it. Again, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And that falls on us too. And, and sometimes it's, and, and there's, there's the way to hear, and we're going to find out now here in 2 Corinthians. So Paul already laid this out. Paul uh, laid it out through Corinthians of what we read with Moses and the veil and 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 then we saw uh, Paul talking in Romans how he was saying hey we don't no, no longer have to be bound to sin that we're, we're we're dead to that and now we could obey Christ and obey him and no longer a slave to sin but now we could be a slave to God and check this out in 2 Corinthians 3 uh, chapter 3 15 verse 18 it goes like this but to this day Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. He said that earlier. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or there is freedom. But we all, again, there's the we, but we all believers, but we all saints, but we all who believe in the finished work of Christ, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit, from glory to glory. Here's the thing, here's the reminder that I, I, I was reminded, because all when I was growing up in church, nobody, nobody really ever showed me the value 
that God had for me, that my value and my identity is in Christ. I was always taught, hey, let's, 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 you don't want to go to the bad place, you don't want to go to hell, so believe in Christ so you can go to heaven. It was always like, a, do this and you get that. It was basically a beneficial gospel. It was a beneficial gospel, so, in, and not to blame anybody, but that's how I heard it. I heard it as a beneficial gospel. And see, growing up, thinking of it as a beneficial gospel, then I'm always thinking of it as, you know, what does God have for me? Okay, I did this for you, Lord, what do you have for me? Okay, and that's a lot of people, I've, I've talked to so many people, and that's, that's kind of the mentality or the perspective, is looking at God in a beneficiary way. Or others have looked at God and God's out to get me because of my past. God is out to get me. I can't run to him. I got to run from him. What did Adam and Eve do? As soon as they bit of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they hid in shame, right? In condemnation, they ran from God. God, they could hear God walking in the garden and they're running away. They're hiding, right? Because there was shame there. And isn't that something that the foreshadow of what God did for them God, they, they hid themselves with leaves, yet God took those leaves off and clothed them. Clothed them by sacrificing an animal. He clothed them in animal skins. And there, there, there was a good point that God was showing us there is because he was, he was saying, I don't want you to look at what you did, though it was wrong, and though it was sin, and sin entered in, and yes, it was wrong, and there's consequences that you're going to have to deal with that, but I don't want you to always kind of look at your shame with condemnation. You know what? Take those things off your coverings, I'm going to cover you with my righteousness. And that's why God clothed Adam, foreshadowing of a clothing of righteousness that was yet to come at that time that we see now today in Christ Jesus. Here's the thing I wrote down as a little side note. Glory to glory. The reason I was saying that story too was from glory to glory, I always heard glory to glory as a level of, of achievement or a level of, 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 of knowing God. So, hey, hey brother, you know, you're just going from glory to glory. You know, just take it one day at a time. You're going from glory to glory. Basically, it was used a lot, and they meant well, but it's, it was used in a lot of ways. It was used like, hey, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to stumble and fall, and that's okay. God's taking you from glory to glory. And there's a level to that, and, and I'll explain a little bit. But it was used from that scripture, taking that one scripture out from glory to glory. But see, we just read it in its whole entire context of what Paul was saying. He meant from glory to glory. What was he talking about? That wasn't he talking about the old covenant being glory and being glorious, but how much more glorious is the new? So when he's talking from glory to glory, he's saying, are we going from the understanding of old covenant to new covenant? And check this out. When he says unveil, I got this yesterday. I said unveil. I said, what is that? What is that, Lord? Unveil. Unveil is the renewed mind, the mind of Christ. See, because he said earlier, he said, when you turn to Christ, we see Christ, we see the veil is lifted when we have our eyes on Christ. Not in our situation, not in our circumstance, but his truth. And what do we know? His truth sets us free. So when we have our eyes on Christ, we are unveiled. Unveiled, renewed mind, because we are learning his ways, not our ways, not the ways that we grew up. Um, in this world. We're not we're, we're in this world, but we're not of it, but we were trained by it So we have to recognize those things and say Lord teach me it says in the scripture Holy Spirit let Holy let, let no one be your teacher, but Holy Spirit let Holy Spirit be your teacher and lead and guide you So check this out As the bride that we are right we're the body of Christ and we are the bride so if we're the bride when we turn to God and we turn to Christ and we put our eyes on Christ He's our groom, right? Just like in, a, in, in an actual marriage, and the bride is coming down, right? What is her eyes looking at? She's coming down that aisle. What does she see? She sees the groom, and she's coming down that aisle, coming down that aisle, and guess what? She's got the veil over her, right? She's got the veil over her, and she's coming down that aisle, coming to her groom. The same way we're coming to Christ, our eyes on Christ, and we see the groom. Jesus and we have our eyes on him and what does he do takes that veil lifts it up and Now with unveiled face we could behold the glory of God We're going from the old understanding of the old covenant to the new understanding of the new covenant that we are made right with God Because of Christ Jesus 
And now he has something so awesome for us because we are no longer under the law. But now we're under the grace of God and there's freedom in that because he wants us to believe something. So we have freedom in Christ. And the thing that, that, that I love about that freedom in Christ is he gave us the opportunity now to love others. To love ourselves and love others. But the only reason we love is because he first loved us. He first loved us. And if once we understand that and we understand, we're like, wow. Because let's be honest, we know the junk that we went through. We know the stuff that we went through. And sometimes it's hard to love us. Sometimes it's hard to love us because we know what we've been through. And we're like, man, how could I be loved? How could God love me? That's why we run from God. Because we understand the things that we've gone through and done to others. My hand's up. The things that I've done because I didn't understand who I was or I didn't love me, then I did what I did to others because I didn't know who I was. But when I understood how much the Father loves me, even when I was out doing whatever I wanted to do and not doing the Father's will, He still loved me. And once I grasped that, and once He showed me that, He's been showing me, but once my eyes were open. My eyes were on Christ and my eyes were open to that. I, beho I beheld him with an unveiled face and I'm like, wow, I am so loved. And then we have this understanding of being so loved that we want to share that love with others. And we want to let them know, man, you are so loved. Because now we start looking at everybody else the same way that God sees us. And that's why Jesus shared those commandments and we'll, we'll go over that here in a minute, but... We are made in his image. I just want to throw some reminders of us that we are made in his image and likeness. So if we are made in his image and likeness, what is his image? What is his likeness? We know God is love, so let's become love. We know God is righteous, so let's be in him because in ourselves we're not righteous, but in Christ we are. See, let's continue to abide in him. Let's continue to know him. Amen. And look in the mirror with boldness and confidence. See, so many times we look in the mirror, let's be honest, we, don't, we, we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see sometimes. We don't like who we were, who we are. We see our, 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 in that reflection, we're seeing kind of our past. We're seeing kind of our past. Just, just the other day, I think it was yesterday, I saw somebody, po actually it was Josh. You posted a, a picture because he's, uh, he's got his coaching and he, he had a picture of a maze and this guy is trying to get out of the maze and right behind him was like the starting point and it was like a wall. Right, and you know how like a, a, a the maze it keeps going going on like a big labyrinth, and so now he's facing a, a way to try to get to okay, let me find my way out. And as I was looking at that picture, it spoke to me because <laughs> it spoke to me because so many times we want to go forward, but there's a past behind us, and that past has built up such a wall that we feel we can't go through it. So what happens is we think we have to go that other direction to get away from it. But maybe, maybe actually God wants us to look at our past and bust that wall down because he's with us and he's going to get us through immediately to the other side. See, if that maze goes like this and it goes all the way around, all the way over to the outside, all the way to right there, basically the other side of the wall of your past. Meaning, if you surrender who you think you are and understand who you are in him, he breaks down that wall of your past and says, that is no longer you, my son. That is no longer you, my daughter. You are made in my image and you are a child of God. And this is what I have for you. I have a hope. I have a future. It is not about what you did, but it's about who I'm making you to be. And you're going to become in me what I have planned for you all along. And so I saw that when that, that, that maze that Josh said, I was like, man, that's, a, that's so awesome. I think that's it for this. Uh, I could freestyle from there. Okay, so so we are made in His image, and one of the things that I that I that I realized was, you know, God in in Matthew seventeen five, Jesus shows up. He takes James and uh, James, uh, Peter, James and John to a high mountain, and he goes. He says. He 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 go, he's just up there, and they, and they're just watching him. They're just waiting, and they're just watching him, and Jesus is there, and all of a sudden. It gets really bright. 
Jesus is looking really, really white. <laughs> and it, it, that's why it's called the transfiguration. He's just looking really glorious. And, and all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appear next to him. And they're talking to him. This is in the Word of God, Matthew 17, 5. And they're talking to him. So immediately, Peter's like, oh my gosh, there's Moses. There's, there's Elijah. Lord, should we build some tabernacles? Should we build three tabernacles? It is obviously good that we're here. You know, Peter, he, he was always a funny guy. Peter. So he's like, he, he's like, hey, we're, it's good right now. Let's, let's, let's build some tabernacles. Let's stay right here. Let's camp right here. And let's just be in this place. And, and in that same moment, as he's speaking, Moses and Elijah disappear and a cloud comes down over Jesus and says this. It says, this is my son who I am well pleased. It's God speaking. This is my son who I am well pleased. Hear him. And here's the thing. Moses and Moses and Elijah were standing right next to Jesus and what I believe those were were Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets and then they were gone they disappeared and now it's just Jesus right and God saying this is my son who I am well pleased you didn't want to hear Moses with the law and the commandments and the glory and he had to cover his face you didn't want to hear him you didn't want to hear what I was saying through the prophets Here's my son, who I love and who I'm well pleased. Hear him. And man, hear him. And we learned this uh, a couple months ago. Hearing um, is the uh, Hebrew word for shema, meaning to listen and obey. And we learned earlier in the scripture to obey God. Walk by the Spirit by obeying God. So listen, obey, and take action to what you heard. That's why all throughout the Bible, you'll see Jesus saying, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So let us hear this new way of life that God wants to live for, uh, that wants us to believe. It's believing in the finished work of Christ, that if he's done it and it is finished, then truly, truly, I say to you, we are no longer in the old covenant glory, but we are in the new covenant glory. And he is out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old past of who we thought we were and into the new creation that God's made us to be. And all we're going to do is, is learn that by knowing him. It says that this is eternal life, that they may know you, right? It says my people perish for a lack of understanding. It also says in all your acquiring of wisdom, get understanding. So if my people perish for the lack of understanding or knowledge, then let's get the understanding. And I believe the understanding is knowing God, knowing Christ. He wants us to be in intimacy with him. So just like that bride coming down the aisle and having the eyes on Christ and looking at the groom and he takes off that veil, let's look at it that way. From here on out, let's look. Hey, I'm in, under the new covenant. I am a new creation in him. He's lifted off the veil. And now I am that blameless, spotless bride that he's coming back for. Because that's what it talks about in Revelation. Amen. That he's coming back for a blameless, spotless bride. How could, we be, how could you and I be blameless and spotless if we've already sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Because we understand that and we believe in the finished work of Christ and we believe what he's done and we believe that he's perfect. So we say, you know what? I'm going to abide in that. Instead of trying to do the 600 and some laws, I'm going to just believe in this. And the reason I was sharing that story with Moses and Elijah is because Jesus said, they asked him, what are your greatest commandments? And he said, these, love your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. For in these, in these, the law and the prophets hang on these. The law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah, hang on these. And who was hanging on the cross? <laughs> Jesus, for us. So check out this visual as we're wrapping up because I'm a little over. Well, the visual of that is next time we're struggling with something of who we were, who we used to be, and how the past creeps in. Because the enemy's going to use that past against you because he's the cut-off withering branch. So he wants to create that same mindset in us and say, oh, you're the cut-off withering branch. No, he is. He's just trying to recreate that same mindset in us. So every time, what did Jesus do when he was tempted and he was in the wilderness? Every single lie that the enemy came... Jesus came with truth. Truth, 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 truth. Just speak the word of God. Speak truth. And, and, and the thing is, 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 
is it was all it was all hung on that. So when we believe in the finished work of Christ, we no longer have to believe in our past of who we were, but we can believe in who we are in Him. The finished work of Christ, going from glory of that old glory to the new glory of the new covenant, simply by believing. And that's why Jesus said, "What what is the work that we need to do? Believe, believe in what God has sent you, His Son." Even the most famous scripture, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved, goes with love, loved the world that he gave, gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever, so that's everybody, nobody's disqualified, whoever, what's the word? Believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Eternal life is just a byproduct because he also tells us to have heaven here on earth. How do we have heaven here on earth? by no longer identifying ourselves to our old selves. Let's crash through that wall of our past and let's enter into this new, this new plan that God has for us, a hope and a future, a plan that he actually knew about us before the foundations of the earth. He knew us before we were in our mother's womb. He's a good, good father and he's got the very best for us. Amen.